hot, only the building blocks of atoms can exist. If you were to journey into the early seconds of the universe, literally you would disintegrate. You would literally fall apart, and even the debris, the, the nuclei of your bodies, they too would fly apart into subatomic particles. There would be nothing left of your body. There's only one way to see these super hot building blocks of matter in the first second after the Big Bang. Scientists must recreate conditions of the Big Bang itself. The inside of a star is measured in tens of millions of degrees. But the Big Bang was measured in trillions upon trillions of degrees. So we have no way to simulate the instant of creation other than with a particle accelerator. By slamming protons into other protons, we can create temperatures not seen since the beginning of the universe itself. So particle accelerators are the only game in town when you talk about simulating genesis. This is Brookhaven National Laboratory in Long Island, home to the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or RIC, a two and a half mile ring designed to smash the nuclei of gold atoms at nearly the speed of light. With the particle accelerator, you slam subatomic particles together. As a consequence, we get a tremendous shower of debris, and then we want to make sense out of it. We want to know what's inside What's inside that collision? The energy of the collision is colossal. On a small scale, it reproduces the embryonic universe in the first second. How? By ripping nuclei into the protons and neutrons they're made from. The energy is even enough to rip the protons and neutrons apart. Inside, Scientists discover the building blocks of matter, tiny particles called quarks. But they're so small and move so fast, they're hard to track. If scientists can figure out how quarks behave, they'll unlock the secret of matter itself. What they find could revolutionize medicine and relaunch the space program. The project starts in 2000. Colliding nuclei creates a chaotic spray of particles. It takes five years to analyze the data. The results come in 2005. They're shocking. We were expecting to find a gas when we slam gold nuclei into each other. So the shock was it wasn't a gas at all. We found that it's more like a liquid. So this came quite a shock, because now when we begin to simulate the early universe, we have to get rid of this mental picture of a gas of subatomic particles. Now we know it's more like a liquid, literally like a soup. When matter first appears in the universe, the quarks are so dense and so energized that the entire universe is like a liquid. The universe went from a glowing ball of energy to quark soup in less than a blink of an eye. The liquid universe is hot, dense, and violent. Flooded with tiny particles in constant vigorous interaction. As our cosmic clock reaches a millionth of a second, the universe continues to expand and cool. It grows from the size of a baseball to the size of our solar system. Matter has materialized from pure energy. Without matter, none of us would be here. And in that first second, that very nearly happens. Something comes close to destroying all matter in the universe. Armageddon is brewing. A split second after the Big Bang, and the universe is flooded with the building blocks of atoms. These tiny particles of matter must survive in a battleground.
Everything around us is made of matter formed from the energy released by the Big Bang. Every molecule, every atom, every quark. How we end up with a universe that consists of so much matter is one of our biggest questions. The particle accelerator may reveal the answer. When the first second is recreated, two types of matter are produced in equal parts. One is the type of matter we see around us. The other is its opposite, antimatter. Dr. Tara Shears explains they're two sides of the same coin. This apple is made of matter. We know that every matter particle in the universe has an antimatter partner that was created in the Big Bang. Now, antimatter looks similar to normal matter, but not quite. In fact, it looks like the mirror reflection of matter. So an anti-apple looks like this. But matter and antimatter are mortal enemies. They can't coexist. Fractions of a second after the Big Bang and the future of the universe is at stake, matter and antimatter are locked in a battle to the death. A millionth of a second after the Big Bang and a battle rages. When matter and antimatter clash, the result is explosive. Just one apple-sized clump of matter hitting its antimatter equivalent would release as much energy as a 10 megaton nuclear bomb. If you could go back to the really early universe just after the Big Bang, you'd find yourself in this seething mass of matter and antimatter annihilating each other. You'd find yourself in the middle of this cosmic battle between both sides, caught in the crossfire, if you like. With all the particles in a super dense liquid state, matter and antimatter quickly meet and destroy each other. Since they're created in equal numbers, and every matter particle that hits an antiparticle is annihilated, all matter should be destroyed as soon as it's created. All the matter would have eventually found the antimatter and they would have annihilated, producing pure radiation. And we'd now have a universe, I was gonna say we'd now be living in a universe of pure radiation, but we wouldn't be living in such a universe because we wouldn't be here. There'd be nothing but radiation. But the universe is full of matter. How did it defeat antimatter? It's one of science's great mysteries. One theory is that antimatter is less stable and decays more quickly creating a tiny imbalance between matter and antimatter. This tiny imbalance eventually allows matter to overwhelm antimatter. Whatever the truth, something happens just after the Big Bang that tips the balance in favor of matter. And the whole battle stopped at that point. And what was left was a very small amount of matter. And it's that small amount of matter that makes the universe that we live in now. That means that we're the leftovers of this battle. We're the dregs. We're what's left when everybody else had finished. The dregs go on to form everything around us. From the ground beneath our feet to the most distant galaxy. As the cosmic clock nears the end of the first second, nature's four forces have split off from the single superforce. The winner of the matter and antimatter war has been decided, and the subtle ripples in temperature that stretch across the universe mean that over the next billion years, gravity gathers clumps of matter to form galaxies. But one mystery remains, and it's a big one. We know how the building blocks of matter form, but we don't know what gives everything in the universe substance. We know so much about the first second, but a piece of the puzzle is missing. 
What gives everything in the universe mass? Mass makes it tough to get something moving and makes it hard to stop. When we're pulled down to Earth, gravity is acting on our mass. On the Moon, gravity is weaker, so astronauts move slower. But their mass is the same as back on Earth. Even if an object weighs nothing, it still has mass. Something must have been created in the first second to give particles mass, but scientists haven't found it. Mass is the very backbone of life. If there were no mass, the universe would consist entirely of radiation, and nothing could bind together to form objects like you or I, or any of the things that appears to make the universe interesting. It would be a diffuse universe full of radiation, but very, very boring. Discover how mass develops in the first second, and you uncover the root of life. If scientists can't find what gives particles their mass, that first second will remain an enigma. Our journey is almost finished, but a piece of the puzzle is missing, and it stumped scientists for decades. Then in 1964, at Britain's University of Edinburgh, physicist Peter Higgs comes up with a groundbreaking theory he suggests an invisible force field sweeps across the universe in the first second, giving particles their 